Okay, so before we begin the class, I'm going to just do the, because we're doing the Omer counting, right? So not only are we counting 49 days from Passover to Shavuot, but each day we're refining a different part of our character. Each day corresponds to, we have um, seven like emotional attributes and three cognitive ones that are like soul, our soul powers, and they all intermix with each other, and each day we work on a different one. So Lagba Omer is Hode of Hode, which is humility in humility. So today is 33 days. Um, today is 33 days, four weeks and five days, so the counting of the Omer, and we're refining our humility, humility within humility. So examine the humility of humility. Everyone has humility and modesty in his or her heart. The question is the measure and manner in which one consciously feels it. Am I afraid to be too humble? Do I mask and protect my modesty with aggressive behavior? Learn to cultivate your humility by interacting with people who are more refined than yourself, evoking in you modesty and humility that motivates you to grow. Humility must also be examined for its genuineness. Is my humility humble? Or is it yet another expression of arrogance? Do I take too much pride in my humility? Do I flaunt it? Is it self-serving? Is my humility part of a crusade or is it genuine? Do I have expectations due to my humility? And the exercise for the day is be humble just for its own sake. All right, so that, that is the attribute that we're working on today as we refine ourselves before getting the Torah, which is coming up on the holiday of Shavuot. And um, just now we're going to jump into learning about Rachel. But just before, I just want to tell you about a few other upcoming things in case anyone is interested in joining them. So first of all, officially, right, this is, we're doing a four-part series on women. Um, but I'm going, continuing Torah and Tea all the way through June 12th for sure. I think that's a Tuesday, right? So in other words, Torah and Tea is continuing Tuesday at this time. And we'll also do some different topics because Shavuot is coming up and I have a really, I want to really address Shavuot and some of the special things about that. Um, so that's coming up next Tuesday. In addition to Torah and Tea at this time, one o'clock in the evening at 7.30, um, we are doing Unorthodox, all your questions answered with Rabbi Menachem and Adina Landa. So if any of you have watched that Netflix series that's going around, or even if you haven't, I haven't, I, but I feel like I have because I heard so much about it. Um, anyways, we are going to like no holds barred, ask all your questions. We're going to have like a really open, candid conversation on Zoom. So that's next Tuesday night at 7.30. Um, my husband does classes Wednesdays at 9.30 a.m. is Tanya. And at 12 is a Yiddish class. Thursday night is Ethics of Our Fathers, Pirkei Avot. And Friday at 7 o'clock, we do a pre-Shabbat inspiration on Zoom. So if you're on our email list, you get all that information to know how to join that, or you can always ask me. And yeah, we look forward to seeing you. Okay, let's dive in. So um, hopefully you have your handout. If not, that's totally fine. Of Rachel, the wife of Rabbi Akiva. Um, okay, let me just address the chats for a second. It's okay, Gail, that you don't have your photo up. We're glad to see you, and you're welcome, Maddie. And Anne says, thank you so much. I'm glad that you're enjoying the class as well. So yes, this is going to continue. I love this time with all of you. All right, and again, remember that you can just unmute yourself at any time to jump in, to ask questions, and also have different people read so that it's not just me talking. Okay. So Rachel, I also have a, a special connection to Rachel because she, that's my middle name. So I feel like in every single class that we've had so far, we've had, right, we've had a Miriam, we've had a Ruth, we've had a, a Tipora. Is anyone else Rachel? No, but my daughter, Rachel. Right. Your daughter, Rachel. Yes. Is Rachel. Rachel, you're a Rachel, Andrea's I daughter. Am. Yes. Yep. Love it. Okay, so there's two like really famous special Ruffles, right? One is one of the matriarchs and she's, I've done a class on her before and she, I love her character as well. So this is a different Ruffle, Ruffle the wife of Rabbi Akiva. So um, you have it on your handout, you have like the, the whole story kind of put into a summary, but I'm going to just briefly go over it and then um, I'll, I'll briefly go over it and then we're going to kind of go into parts of it in depth. 
Okay, so it, it helps us to understand the power of Rachel. It helps us to also understand the power of Rabbi Akiva. Okay, because Rabbi Akiva, he went from being a simple shepherd, Akiva ben Joseph, to being literally one of the Torah giants. Okay, so um, our sages say that he was one of the greatest scholars of all times. I'm kind of reading at the beginning of your handout. With his sharp mind, the sages said he could uproot mountains. And he explained every single letter of the Torah, even the little crowns that adorn many of the letters of the Torah. So he, he was one of the four great sages who tried to enter the deepest secrets of creation and of learning. And he was the only one who came out sound of body and plain of mind. That's kind of a separate story. But um, any Mishnah that we don't know who it's attributed to, like it doesn't say who it's attributed to, is attributed to Rabbi Akiva. So much of Jewish law, so much of the learning that we have today is attributed to Rabbi Akiva. Um, we have, there's like 12, for any of you that came to my series where we did like the 12 foundational verses that have like foundational truths of Judaism. So one of it is in the, in the Torah, it says, love your fellow as yourself. Right? So the verse that we, from that, like Rabbi Akiva said, love your fellow as yourself is the most important principle in the Torah. The rest, right? Um, not, not the part where the rest is commentary, go and learn. That's a different story. But he said it's right. It's the most important principle in the Torah. And so this is like repeated all the time about, from Rabbi Akiva and all of his teachings. Um, so this is a story where Rabbi Akiva started from, you know, like the, the, story, the concept of like from rags to riches, like he was poor, he was simple, he was unlearned, he was the son of converts, he didn't know anything, right? And, and then we're going to see where he rose to, but really, it's all because of Rachel. And if not for Rachel, we wouldn't have had Rabbi Akiva. If not for Rachel, I mean, just, it's unbelievable to see like what, like the, all, like, a, a beautiful quote that we're going to hear later on how Rabbi Akiva attributes everything he has. He says it's all because of Rachel. So Rachel was, in a sense, the opposite. She was the daughter of Kalba Savua, who was very, very, very wealthy. He was kind of like a Jewish leader type at that time. He always had people in his home. He was uh, very generous. He was also, he was scholarly, right? And so Rachel kind of the opposite, grew up in prestige and in wealth and kind of had like every um, opportunity available to her, so to speak, okay? And Kalba Savua, her father, when it became time for Rachel to get married, he would constantly bring in all these different eligible young men for Rachel to meet and she would turn all of them down, each one. And we're gonna see in the story how who Rachel chooses on her own is Akiva, who Akiva becomes a shepherd working for her father. So he's just, a, he's not Rabbi Akiva, he's Akiva, and he's just a simple shepherd boy. And that is who Rachel becomes attracted to. And she sees in him something so much greater. She sees that he's destined for more. So she wasn't looking at his current self, she was seeing his potential, and she knew this is the person I wanna marry. Um, okay. I can like keep on going, <laughs> but I feel like we should dive in and then we're going to learn more about, about the story right there. So if you go to text number one, um, it's on page two. So text number one, just to understand, Kalba Savua means a satiated dog. That's what the name means. And that's how we refer to Rachel's father. And Rashi tells us he was like nicknamed Kalba Savua because whoever came to his house hungry like a dog would leave satisfied. In other words, it's showing his wealth and his generosity that he was always feeding hungry, pe feeding hungry people, inviting people into his home. He was a very, very generous person. That's just to give us a little bit of understanding of, of Rachel and the background she grew up in, the household she grew up in. But then we get Rabbi Akiva, some different texts on Rabbi Akiva. This is who he was at the beginning. The Talmud tells us, text number two, Rabbi Akiva was such an ignoramus at the time that he did not know a single halacha. He couldn't even read the Aleph Bet, okay? He couldn't read Aleph Bet. He didn't know any Jewish law. So we're talking about zero in Judaism. And furthermore, he harbored a hatred 
toward Torah scholars, okay? Because he felt like there's this divide, right? The Torah scholars that are so learned and they don't, you know, and, and wealthy, so they're able to sit and learn and I just have to be a, a shepherd boy. Like he didn't even respect the Torah scholars. So it's not only did he not know, right? Because there was like people that were the wood choppers and the water carriers or whatever it is that didn't know Torah, but they, you know, would sit by the feet, so to speak, of the sages and try to learn and try to grow however they could. That wasn't Akiva. He was like, not interested. Um, and then text number three, the Rambam tells us he was poor. He was the son of a convert. So which actually, once we see that complete shift and change that Rabbi Akiva made, he like provides hope and inspiration, right? For someone who starts learning very late in life. We learned from Rabbi Akiva that it's never too late. He was 40 when he started learning Alphabet. And again, he came from you know, his background to where he, where he became to, like how he grew and became one of our greatest sages. Okay. So again, Rabbi Akiva was one of the, sh the um, shepherds. He was the shepherd for the wealthiest man in Jerusalem, Kalba Sabua. And when his daughter, and when Kalba Sabua's daughter, Rachel, saw Rabbi Akiva, she saw that he was modest. She saw that he had fine character and she really wanted to marry him. And she told him that. And he kind of like laughed it off, like, you know, I, like, what, what do you see in me? What do you want from me? I don't, you know, I don't even know any Torah. I don't know anything. There's no, you know, like, look who you have available to you. Look at the choices you have. And he just didn't think that there was anything to it. And so he kind of kept brushing her off, even though she kept um, kind of pursuing him, which by the way, I think is so fascinating. <laughs> I bring this up, I think, in every class, but we spoke about Ruth. Um, how she uh, proposed to Boaz and the commentary that says that Tzipora proposed to Moses. And now here, Rachel proposed to Rabbi Akiva and I proposed to my husband. So <laughs> I think as, I think we're just break, like it's, we can just break all these conventional norms or they're not the norms, look in Torah. I don't know when it became that the man proposes to the woman, but we have so many cases where that isn't true. So I just think that's funny. Um, anyways, so in text number four, this is a very, very, very famous story. Text number four, where we see where, where Rabbi Akiva, or not, he's not Rabbi Akiva yet, he's Akiva, he has his first like turnaround a little bit. <laughs> Maddie says, seems like the woman has to make the first move. Could be, these men are slow, <laughs> slow to catching on. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, so this is a very, very famous story about Rabbi Akiva, where he has like this first turnaround to understanding what Rachel sees in him. All right, Tessa, do you want to read that for us? I do not have the hand that I couldn't, I couldn't get, get it. Oh no, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's okay, I'm a good listener. Okay. So right. I'm, I'm enjoying other people reading or okay. you reading. Thanks. Sounds good. Andrea, what about you? Sure. Perfect. One day, while sitting by a brook, Akiva noticed a steady trickle of water hitting a rock. It was only a drip, but it was constant, drop after drop after drop. Akiva observed something incredible. A hole had been carved out by that, by that steady drip of water. He wondered how that could be. He concluded, if something as soft as water can carve a hole in a solid rock, how much more can words of Torah which is hard as iron, make an indelible impression on my heart. Yeah, I love that. So it's a very famous story, right? Where he, he kind of sees that if water, after so long, just drip by drip by drip, right? Like little, little movement can make a hole in the rock, then the words of Torah that are so strong can clearly pierce my heart. And that was really a turning point for him. That is when he committed to like, when he said yes to Rachel, he said, yes, I, I'm committing to, to marry you and I'm going to like do what it takes. And again, we know that he went on to become one of the greatest sages with 24,000 students. And so just think about the idea that like a drop of water changed his life. I mean, Rachel changed his life, but the inspiration came from like the, the realization that what she saw in him, he could also see in himself came from this point where he saw this drop of, of water. Um, Okay, so that gets us to text number five, where again, 
uh, this is like Ruchel's proposal over here. Um, do you want to read that for us, Aviva? I don't have the paper. So oh, yeah, the paper. All right, no problem. Let's see. What about you, Rita? Who's offering? Just unmute yourself and jump in. Naomi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kalba Savua's daughter saw that he was modest and of fine character. She asked him, if I become betrothed to you, will you go to the academy to study Torah? He said to her, yes. He betrothed her in secret. Yeah. So they actually secretly, they knew that this wasn't going to go over very well with Kalba Savua, with Rachel's father, and they got engaged in secret. And if you really think about it, how powerful this is, um, and I just, Maddie said, it's so inspiring that he started when he was 40. Yes, yes, absolutely. And really a powerful message for all of us, right? That it's like never too late ever at any age to learn. We're exactly where we need to be. <laughs> um, so, um, so Rachel, right? It's so incredible just to think that she had literally like she was a very refined, dignified, wealthy, you know, young woman. And she really had everything at her disposal. And she had many eligible young men that she could have chosen from, so to speak. And she wasn't interested. And she just, she saw something in Rabbi Akiva. And that was it. She's like, I see his potential. And this is, this is what I want. So they get engaged. And this is what happens when her father finds out about it. That's text number six. No, she was not a prophet. Um, Maddie, what seems to be a theme? Okay, sorry, I'm just I'm in the chat. So Naomi asked, was Rachel a prophet? The answer is no. Maddie says it seems to be a theme. Not sure which one. You, you let me know what the theme is. Okay, Rita, do you want to jump in there and read text number six? You're muted. There we go. Now you're unmuted. Start from the beginning. <laughs> Start from the beginning. Okay. Yeah. The daughter of Kalba Savua became betrothed to Rabbi Akiva. When her father heard about it, he threw her out of the house and pronounced a vow prohibiting her to, be to benefit from any of his possessions. She then went and became married to Rabbi Akiva in the winter. As a result of their poverty, they would sleep on straw and Rabbi Akiva would pluck the straw from her hair. He said to her, if I had the means, I would place upon you a Jerusalem of gold. Jerusalem of gold was a gold ornament for a woman, upon which was engraved a picture of Jerusalem. According to Rashi, it was a tiara. Elijah the prophet came, appearing to them in the guise of a person, and he called out the door. Elijah said to them, please give me a little straw. For my wife has given birth and I have nothing upon which to lay her down. Rabbi Akiva said to his wife to comfort her, See, here is a person who lacks even straw. During this period, Rabbi Akiva supported his wife and children by gathering wood and selling some of it. Rachel also contributed by selling her hair for the production of wigs. Okay. So... Okay, so first of all, we see that as soon as Rabbi Akiva, sorry, as soon as Kalba Savua found out that Rachel was engaged to Rabbi Akiva, he, to Akiva, he disowned her, okay? So he disowned her, threw her out of the house, cut her out of his estate completely. So now they are left penniless and they go live in a shack. And... Um, and they slept on straw, straw, right? Because they literally had nothing. And Rabbi Akiva and the, would pluck out all the straw from Rachel's hair each day, right? Because he felt bad that she was sleeping on straw and probably wasn't the most comfortable. And he said to her, if I had the money, I would buy you a Jerusalem of gold, which is like a, pen, like a pendant or a tiara that made out of gold that had Jerusalem engraved on it. Later in the story, we're going to see that he does just that, which I think is so beautiful. And then this other piece where Elijah, Eliyahu, um, came like as a person, came in, in the guise of a person, and he asked for, he said, oh, my wife's in labor. Do you have some straw? 
And Rabbi Akiva said to his wife, like, look, there's even people with no straw. In other words, they, they really tried to make the best of it and just be like, this is, this is where we're at and this is okay. And Rachel never was complained about it, ever. She was not like the least bit sad or, or at least that we know of, right? She was very proud. Like she chose this. She knew this, right? Um, Maddie, would God not see her father as a Russia for doing that to his daughter? Um, I don't know, but we do. Are, we are going to see how he he regretted his what he did and he took it back, so to speak. So I don't think he is ever considered as a Russia for that. Would we call what he did a good thing? No, but he definitely regretted it. Adina, um, Adina this is Harriet. Yes. I'm doing Daf Yomi where you read a Talmud every day. Yeah. And yesterday or the day before was all about what women should wear out on Shabbat and whether they can wear that tiara with the Jerusalem on it. And so I, I love the fact yeah. that within two days of learning about it, I learn about it again. Love it. And what was the conclusion? I think, I'm trying to remember, I think if they've worn it before, it's okay. It's not showing off. As she's not supposed to take it off and mm -hmm. show what she has. Mm -hmm. I think. I have to go okay. back. All right. Sounds good. If it would be considered a piece of jewelry, right? So like on Shabbat, because we don't carry in public, in public spaces, but if something's jewelry for a woman, then it's like adornment, like it's fine. Like for example, this is interesting, side point, a little bit of a, a, little bit of a uh, diversion, but like a watch, women are allowed to wear watches on Shabbat and men are not. Because if, if the watch stops working, right, then it would be called muksa because there's no need for it anymore on Shabbat if it stops working. But for a woman, the watch could be considered her jewelry. Like even if it stops working, she could still wear it because it's her jewelry. Whereas for a man, the, the function of the watch is just to be a watch. And so if it would stop working on Shabbat, then he'd be wear, wearing something that's muksa. So I'm going to assume that the pendant or the tiara, the Jerusalem of gold, is the concept of like if she's using it as like jewelry for her adornment, then you could absolutely wear it out on Shabbat. Plus, you know what else? What is the first syllable of jewelry? Just saying. Ooh, <laughs> what do you make that mean? <laughs> that means Jewish women can wear jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And okay. should, and should. Yeah. Um, Maddie, I don't know if you saw that, Harriet. Maddie says it's a sign for you to wear a tiara because, <laughs> because you learned about it yesterday and now today. Um, but yes, it is a theme. This is a theme that Maddie was talking about for women looking deeper than material, which is anyways hugely a Jewish concept, not just for women, for all of us across the board to look beyond just the physical that we see um, and just and beyond the material. And so clearly in this scenario, that's exactly what Rachel does, right? She knows, she knew, I think, that it wasn't going to go so well for her marrying Rabbi Akiva, but that didn't matter to her. So, okay, so now, and then we also see that Rabbi Akiva, right, so now they're, they're very poor. They had three children, and Rabbi Akiva um, would collect wood, they, and now he doesn't have a job, right? Not only does she not have her father's money, he's not a shepherd for her father anymore either. So he would collect wood and sell it. That was one way that they would, um, that they would support themselves, and Rachel would sell her hair. For the production of wigs. Okay, so now, right, now we know, okay, they're married, they're living in poverty. Rachel is very happy with her choice. Um, we see this, like, beautiful interaction between them of how Rabbi Akiva is trying to, like, uplift and, you know, not, I don't know if apologize for their poverty is the word, but he, you know, he feels for, for them and where she came from and everything, and Rachel is, like, perfectly at peace with, like, this sacrifice that she made. But, what about this fulfillment of her desire that he go off and study? So now she gets very creative um, of what she has Rabbi Akiva do to really convince him like, okay, now it's time for you to go study, right? So the Midrash tells us this. Um, okay, the, the beginning part is not a quote from the Midrash. So it's more of like how we get into the next part of it. So just don't, it's not direct quotes from over there. Um, Let's see, who would like to read that for us? Harriet, do you want to read that for us, text number seven? Rachel closed her eyes and leaned back heavily on her bed. 
until now her hopes and dreams had worked magic on her dingy surroundings. But what if Akiva's embarrassment kept him from taking that first step? What if her future would be no different from her life today? What of her dreams of a husband great in Torah learning? Would she remain a shepherd's wife forever? Was it for this that she had forsaken not only her wealth, but her father's love? Rachel knew she had to do something, but what, argue, threaten? She fell asleep still wondering, but in the morning she awoke with an answer. The sun had just begun to rise when she tiptoed out of the house. Bringing the donkey to the front of the shack, she tied it to a post, packed moist earth all over its back, and sprinkled seeds on the dirt. By now, Akiva had come outside, where he stood watching his wife in amazement. amazement. What are you doing? he asked. Be patient, she answered mysteriously. You will see. Finally, the seeds sprouted and grew tall. It looked as if a bed of wild weeds were growing right out of the donkey's back. Akiva called Rachel one day. We have run out of flour. Would you please take our donkey to the marketplace and buy some? Akiva looked at the beast and then back at Rachel. Take our donkey to the market? Of course, Rachel replied matter-of-factly as she unhitched the donkey from the post. How else will you carry the flour? But everyone will laugh at me. Akiva protested. Don't worry, answered Rachel as she handed him the reins. Every soul was given its portion of Torah wisdom, she thought as she watched Akiva and the donkey disappear in the distance. My husband is as obligated as anyone else to become a scholar and share his portion with the world. Can he allow people's laughter to stand in his way? Does a man cease to eat because of laughter? Okay, so this is so great because Rachel got really creative over here, right? So she, she had already, you know, put into Rabbi Akiva's mind that he could become, that he can learn and that he can become great. And he saw the, the water going into the rock and he got inspired from that and he agreed, right? But then clearly we see here that there was like some humiliation involved in his beginning of learning, right? And his like, really like, first of all, um, in order to start learning before he can go away to yeshiva, he would have to learn the Aleph bet, which means I actually didn't find a source for this. So I don't know if it's true or if this is just how I was told the story as a kid, but that he literally started going to like cheder. So he's sitting in a classroom with like kindergartners and first graders learning Aleph bet. And that's where he started, like a 40 year old man. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, because I did not find a source for that. I, yes. This, yes, I heard the same thing. Right? And I'm like, yeah. I couldn't find a source. I'm looking all over. I'm like, where does it say that? Like, I see where it says he went away to yeshiva. But anyway, so I, I'm going to keep looking. <laughs> but it's like what happened to our grandparents when they came, you know, in the early 1900s. Yeah. Many of them, when they went to school, if they had the opportunity to go to school, you know, like a 15-year-old was put in the first grade to get, it's the same concept right. to bring your English up to speed. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it takes a little bit of humility, right? Today's Safira that we were talking about. It takes some humility to be like, you know what? It doesn't matter what age I am. This is where I'm out of my learning. I'm ready to go learn. So Rachel had this idea of how to show her husband that like embarrassment doesn't need to get in the way of achieving our dreams and of where we want to go, right? So she takes this donkey and she like basically creates a little garden on the back of her donkey and then asks Rabbi Akiva to go buy them some flour using their donkey. And he's like, <laughs> what? Um, and, and then he, you know, she basically says, like, he's like, everyone's going to laugh at me. And, and the concept of like, if you need food, right? If you have to support your family, who cares if people are going to laugh at you while you go get your flower? And the idea here of basically to really impress upon him, right? Can, can laughter stand in the way of getting what you want? And I think this is also a very um, powerful lesson in number one, doing what it takes to achieve our dreams, right? And like this, this idea of humility that we were talking about today, Lagba Omar, Hod of Hod, like true, the true essence of humility is like putting aside our ego or our embarrassment or our thoughts of what is someone else going to think of us in order to really do what's right. So text number eight. This is a, you know, powerful um, story. 
<laughs> he didn't scrape the garden off. Maddie says, brilliant. Interesting that he didn't scrape the garden off. Well, I think that would also not be very um, supportive of his wife <laughs> who made a garden <laughs> on the back of her donkey. Okay, so we get up to text number eight, which is in, in the Talmud. Rabbi Akiva went and he spent 12 years at the academy. So he went away from home finally, right? He got, he got the courage. He went away for 12 years. 12 years that Rachel is living in poverty and raising her children herself. When he returned home, this is after 12 years, he had 12,000 students. He brought with him 12,000 students. And he's literally like on his way home and outside of his home, there's, this is where we see that there's not just Yenta women, there are Yenta men, okay? So there was a man, a townsman, I don't know if he was a neighbor of Rachel or just lived somewhere in the town, who was not a good person. I think actually he's called wicked somewhere. Um, not a good person and very much a Yenta. And he says to Rachel, how long, well, first he actually, there's two different sources for the same thing, but one place adds a little bit more to the story. So actually first he says, like, it's a good thing that your father disowned you because you married down, like, you know, what were you thinking to marry um, Akiva or whatever it is. And then he says, how long are you going to, like, he's kind of mocking her. Like, look, look, your husband just left you for 12 years that you're raising your kids yourself and you're in poverty. And, um, you know, he says to her, like, how long are you going to lead, lead this? life of being a widow. And she says, if he would listen to me, he would go back, he would sit in the academy another 12 years. And this part tugs at my heart a little bit, but Rabbi Akiva overheard this conversation and he said, if that is what my wife wants, right? She wants it and she's giving me permission to, to do it. He turns around, doesn't even see her and goes back for another 12 years. Okay. So now he's away from home for 24 years and he comes back with 24,000 disciples. Okay. And this gets up to this, the next part where he's back after 24 years. Text number nine. This is a continuation of that Talmud. Um, let's see. Who wants to read that for us? Jolie, do you want to read that for us? Text nine. His wife heard of his arrival and went out to meet him. Her neighbor said to her, borrow some respectable clothes and dress yourself. She said to them, a righteous man knows his animal's soul. A righteous person knows what even his animals lack. Her meaning was that Rabbi Akiva knew of her poverty and would not disdain her on account of it. When she reached him, she fell on her face and kissed his feet. His attendants pushed her away. When Rabbi Akiva said to them, leave her alone. The Torah that is mine and the Torah that is yours is really hers. Okay. I think this is also really powerful is that, you know, it's like this, everyone knows there's this great sage coming to town. He has his entourage. He's coming with all of his students. It was like this big deal for everyone. And people tell Rachel that she should, you know, dress finer and dress in a better way if she's going to go greet her husband. And she says... Like, he knows. <laughs> He's not expecting me to figure out how to, you know, be uh, dressed differently because he understands that I've been living in poverty. And she kind of pushes her way forward through the crowd and, like, falls at his feet. Like, she's so excited to see her husband again after 24 years. And people are kind of, like, pushing her away. Like, who is this, this lady and who does she think she is? You know, just kind of pushing through the crowd. And, they, you know, she wasn't – she was dressed maybe in rags. I don't know. Like, not in, you know – um, not in finery or whatever it is, and Rabbi Akiva stops them. And the wording, um, let me see if I can remember it in Hebrew. Um, uh, I don't remember it, but the English, it's very powerful. The Torah that is mine and the Torah that is yours is really hers. And in that moment, he attributes everything, all of it. He said it's because of Rachel in front of everyone. Like basically saying, I'm nothing without her every single piece of Torah knowledge I have is because of her. And not only that, every single piece of Torah knowledge that all of you have, talking to 24,000 students, all of it is because of Rachel. And I think it's, it's really, really powerful. Um, Rashi says on that, text number 10, the Torah knowledge that you and I have acquired is the result of her efforts. So like in that one sentence, he's giving 
all of the credit for all of it to Rachel, which I think she actually deserves, <laughs> you know, the sacrifice and what she put into all of that. I think she absolutely deserves. So that's like a really powerful moment right there. Um, and then here is where we get to the other part about Rachel's father. So these two instances happen kind of at this, as this entourage of with Rabbi Akiva is coming back. Um, so let's see. So we're up to text number 11. Do you want to read that for us, Ria? Her father heard that a great man had come to town. He said, I shall go to him. Perhaps he will annul my vow. He came to Rabbi Akiva, and Rabbi Akiva asked him, Did you make the vow with the intent that it would apply even if your son in law becomes a great man? He replied, Even if he would know just one chapter of Mishnah or even one halacha, I would not have made the vow. Rabbi Akiva said to him, I am he. Kalba Savua fell on his face and kissed him on his foot, and he gave Rabbi Akiva half of his possessions. Okay, so thank you. So we see, here's the other part is we could, we see that clearly Kalba Savua at some point was very regretful of this vow that he made and of disowning his daughter and throwing her out of the house and all of that because he's hearing that there's a great man coming and he's like, well, maybe this great sage will annul my vow. Like I could take it all back. And so he doesn't realize that it's his son-in-law, Rabbi Akiva. He, so he goes over to him and he says, you know, he explains about this vow that he made and Rabbi Akiva says to him, did you make it when you made this vow? Did you intend that even if he does end up learning something or becoming great, that, that, that it should still apply, right? So clearly also I think that his upsetness was that his anger was at the fact that his son-in-law was not a learned person. Right? Well, all of it, right? All of it mixed together. And Kabbalah Sefua answers, he says, even if you would just know one thing, one chapter of Mishnah, one halacha, something, if you knew something, I would never have, have made that vow. And then Rabbi Akiva says, I'm him. And this is right where Kabbalah Sefua does teshuva. He clearly feels bad for what he did. did. And, Rab and Rabbi Akiva and Rachel are now part of his estate again, and they become very wealthy. Um, and it's interesting because then in text number 12, the Talmud tells us Rabbi Akiva became wealthy from a number of sources. One of them is from his father-in-law, Kalba Savua. And I think what's really interesting is that the Gemara tells us this here so that nobody thinks the reason he's wealthy is because of the tuition that he charged his thousands of students. Like it's not because of what he charged um, in order for his students. He actually taught everyone free of charge. He had the, the feeling, right? You have to love your fellow as yourself, but knowing for himself how he came from so much poverty and the um, self-sacrifice that he went through in order to learn, he didn't want anyone to have to like jump through any hoops. And he actually taught everything free of charge. So his wealth came, came to us from other, came to him from other places. Um, and then we get to this beautiful part of the story that I absolutely love. Um, text number 13. Let's see, Jody, do you want to read that for us? We don't hear you. Oh, start over. Now we hear you. I hear oh, sorry. You. After Rabbi Akiva became wealthy, he fulfilled his promise he had made to Rachel long before to give her a Jerusalem of gold. And you could continue to text. According, yeah. according to Ben Yehuda, Rabbi Akiva himself fastened the tiara upon her head. This evoked a complaint from his disciples. Rabbi Akiva replied, she suffered with me greatly for Torah and is therefore deserving of this honor. Yes. And so here we have, again, that now that he is restored to, not restored, but now that he is wealthy, he fulfills his promise. He buys her this beautiful tiara with the golden Jerusalem on it, and he himself puts it on her and really acknowledges that everything he has, again, another like public acknowledgement, everything he has is because of her and because of her self-sacrifice. And it's interesting because even the way she, she suffered with me greatly for Torah, I don't, we don't see anywhere that Rachel viewed it as a, a suffering or as a sacrifice, which I think is really incredible. Um, okay. 
Oh, Maddie. Okay, so just a few other questions. Um, what other places brought him wealth? I don't know. It doesn't say. Um, we know one of them is from his father-in-law, but it could be other places as well. I mean, sometimes it's very common for people to just, even, even, if, um, even if a Torah scholar doesn't charge for what they're you know, offering or teaching or whatever, it's also very possible that people would just give donations, right? Like happen all the time, like for the Rebbe, how did the Rebbe have like dollars to hand out? Every time someone would come to the Rebbe, he'd give them a dollar to give to charity. But like we're talking about thousands of dollars, um, but people would just send in donations sometimes to the Rebbe and then that's what he would use without requesting it or, or charging or asking for it or anything like that. So that's also possible that he didn't charge his students, but they could have compensated him in some way. Some of Adina, them. Why, yeah. why did putting the crown on her evoke a complaint from his disciples? Because it was uh, showy off or why? Yeah, um, I'm going to assume, but I don't know for sure. Um, I'm going to assume because of the way the text sounds that if it evoked a complaint from his disciples, then he kind of made it like a public it wasn't just like in his house putting it on her, right? Because then they wouldn't even know. It was sort of like a, a public display of like, look at my, my wife, Rachel, and I'm going to assume that they didn't think it was like a modest act, right? Like why in public are you adorning your wife with, with a piece of jewelry? And that, like they thought, thought it's, there's something immodest about it. And he said, like, no, she, she suffered with me greatly for Torah and she deserves this honor. Like he's saying, this is an honor and I want to publicly honor her in this way. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then here again in, in text 15, we have a little bit more of a description on that. You want to read that for us, Maddie? Sure. I'd love to. I'm actually holding back tears right now because I'm finding this whole thing so moving. It is. Um, okay. Text 15. Mm-hmm. In appreciation of his wife's sacrifice, Rabbi Akiva presented his wife with an elaborate gold pendant engraved with the domes and hills of the holy city of Jerusalem. When the wife of another great Torah sage, Ravan Gamliel, saw Rachel's necklace, she enviously asked her husband to gift her something similar. He replied, would you do for me what Rachel did for Rabbi Akiva? <laughs> the necklace symbolized the mutual commitment the couple had for each other and for their values. Yeah. So, so beautiful. Yeah, I think it's super powerful. Um, just by the way, because I think in last class or the class before, someone brought up The Red Tent. Yeah, me. That was me. <laughs> that was you? Okay. That's not a book that, that I like at all, and I don't think it's um, accurate, and it's not accurately sourced or anything. But there is a book called And Rachel Was His Wife. And that one is very accurately sourced with a lot. It's a, and it's like, it's almost like a novel, like written as a novel, but it's the story of Rabbi Akiva and Rachel with so much other stuff from that time period, very accurately sourced. And I highly recommend it. So if why, is it this, why is it you don't like that book? Just out of interest. Um, the the Red Tent? Not, yeah. I don't think it's an accurate description and uh -huh. depiction of the story. Okay. Yeah, there's so it's many a, things. It's a novel. It's written as a novel. It's like an historical novel. Right. So it's like, um, <laughs> this is going to open up a whole nother can of worms, right? So it's a, it's a romance novel, right? But you're taking a, a, a person, you know, Dina, who is a person who lived and creating a novel about her, but it's not accurate. It's not true, right? So in other words, in my mind, go write a romance novel, create a romance novel, no problem. But don't do it about Dina, who is like, um, you know, our matriarch, one of her matriarchs, like a really, and, and then do it a bad job of it. That's kind of my, like, in other words, if you're going to write about Dina, write about her accurately. It's kind of like you can, someone could write about Rabbi Kiva and Rachel also, and then make up all this stuff. And um, I, I don't know, it just doesn't, I feel like if you're going to, you, like historical novels are fine, but then they need to be accurate. That's just kind of my opinion, okay? <laughs> Lots of opinions going on in the comments, but that's just my opinion. Um, and it's okay. <laughs> you're all welcome to read it and you're welcome to enjoy it. I'm just offering you my opinion of the book is that it's not accurate and I think it portrays the real story in a very negative light. Um, 
Okay, but I also have to say it's been a really long time since I read it as well. So maybe I'll read it again and see if my opinion has changed. Okay. But do you know? So, yes. Um, I hate to be critical of someone like Rabbi Akiva. Yes. But um, 24 years, he leaves his wife and she's raising children in poverty. Mm -hmm. um, that just doesn't sit so well with me. Yeah. And her father, too. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't think that there's anything I can say to explain it or to, because you know what? It doesn't sit so well with me either. In the sense that I'm not letting my husband go away for 24 years. He'd be lucky if I let him go, go, go away for a week, right? But here's where we could put it in context is Rachel wanted it. Yeah. She did. This was not like, you know, I'm stuck at home with the kids while my husband gets to go off and learn. It's not that scenario. It's she asked him to go. And when he came, he was on his way back and overhears her saying like, if it was up to me, he'd go back another 12 years. He has my full permission for that, right? I don't know exactly the words of the conversation. What we have recorded in the Talmud is what's here, right? Where she said, I don't know, look back at that text. But like in her mind, it was like, this is all I want. I want my husband to become a Torah scholar because she saw his greatness. She saw his potential. And I think for that, Rachel gets so much credit, you know, like, yeah, this is a huge sacrifice. Like that doesn't sit well with me either, but and, she wanted and, that. Adina? Yeah. I, I don't like her father in this story at all. He was so um, hung up on his principles that he sees, I'm sure they lived in the same town, the same village. He sees his daughter and his grandchildren in abject poverty for 24 years mm -hmm. and doesn't do anything. And then because his son-in-law all of a sudden is a scholar, he makes tshuva and then everybody has, to, then everything is fine. Yeah. So you, yeah, you can forgive, but you certainly wouldn't forget. Although you could, but um, just just one little tweak in that is that it wasn't once he saw that his, his son-in-law was a scholar, he was coming to Rabbi Akiva as like a sage to annul his vow that he made. So he already felt guilty before then. Now, I'm not saying like, you know, that could be 24 years too late or why wouldn't you, you know, yeah, how could you just literally disown your daughter and see that she's living in such poverty? Um, I don't, I don't want to excuse it. <laughs> right. I don't think, you know, like, I think it's just like, this is the story and the power that I take, like, even if you want to take a lesson in power from, from Kalba Savua, the way I would say, look at the power of Teshuva. Look at the power of like, cause that's another thing. If we learn from Rabbi Akiva, it's never too late to start learning. You could be 40 and go to Cheder and learn the Aleph Bet right? Then we can learn from Kalba Savua that, you know what, as much as we can dislike behavior and whatever, it's, we're always redeemable. It's always okay to be like, wow, I'm royally messed up and I want to do Teshuvah now. But I don't want to say that it's okay that he did that to his daughter. It's very sad. But from that, I think the bigger part that I want to focus on here is what we see from Rachel. Like she, she knew that that could happen and she didn't even like nowhere in this. Do we see her fetch or complain or play victim or regret? None of it. Adina, how many children did they have? Three. And, and we're going to so, talk about one of their daughters in a moment. Okay. So he never saw the this. children. He never saw the children mature and grow and be part of their lives. For those 24 years, yeah. That's really bad. <laughs> I, I raised my hand digitally. Yes, digital. I see that. I'm trying to get to you. Go ahead, Judith. I'll be patient. I don't want to interrupt. Was that Aviva? Okay. So we're talking about the Torah, and I think Rachel is, is th thinking of, you know, the good of the whole world, not herself. This is like a big deal. Yeah. So it's like when people give their lives for war, for freedom, or to fight, you know, she's 
she's thinking of the whole world. So this is not your ordinary yeah, thank you situation for that. Your people. This is like it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much the for the other thing is, yeah. I don't know about all of you, but I've done some pretty bad things when I was younger and that I'm ashamed of. Also, I'm not ashamed of this because my parents didn't teach me, but I didn't get any education. Uh, maybe, no, I went to Sunday school. I did get a little bit, but I didn't get any deep Jewish education until I was much older. Like, I don't know Hebrew like a lot of you do. And so I really relate to um, Rab Rabbi Akiba, 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 Akiba doing this and Ra and Rachel seeing the good in him, like maybe a rabbi and, and you and I'll see and all of us, the ones of us that aren't very educated. So I think that's an amazing story that yeah. being older and studying a lot of you, a lot of the women here at our class. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so good to see you. Um, a lot of us had good training. A lot of us didn't. And some of us, when we went to Chabad, got better training. So I really love this story personally. Me too. And I definitely would not like to be raise my kids alone, but you know, these are special people. That's why we name our children after them. And this is saving the world. I mean, to have a, a, a Torah where you can pass it on and he's passing it on to 24,000 people. And then today, million, you know, as the years went on millions of people. So I think you can make an exception for being away from your husband for 24 years. If you feel this deeply, not you, I can understand somebody doing that. Yeah. And I think, again, we want to just keep in mind that Rachel wanted this, right? Yeah. So, she said she wanted to save the world. <laughs> she wanted the Torah. And of course, Rabbi Akiva grew to love it and teach it. And right. So exactly. So we can get all, you know, these are special stories. That's why we learn about them. They're not right. you and me. A hundred percent. And it's very easy, right? To fall into judgment or to be like, how could Rabbi Akiva do this or something like that? But it's so interesting. Like, it's not my life. Like, I don't have to be, do this. It doesn't have to be the choice I make in my life, but Rachel wanted it. Right. Like, it's almost like if you would sit down with them and be like, how, you know, no, no, <laughs> how could you do this? Like Rachel's like, what do you mean? Like, I am willing to let my husband go and study and get 24,000 disciples and do all of that for the Jewish people, for the continuation of Torah. I am going to do this happily and willingly. And maybe if you sat down with Rabbi Akiva, he would say, you know how hard it was for me to be away from my family? But I did this because my wife wanted me to. She and saw this potential. Too, but she was willing to do the, the difficult. We don't I know. But anyway, I just, um, and I definitely think it can take decades before people get repentance or get right. lives that, that doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I find this story very, very, very powerful. Um, okay. Let me just go back into the comments for a second. Wow. There's so many. Okay. Um, hold on. Just going into the comments and welcome to my mother-in-law who's catching oh, yeah. the, the tail end of our class. Okay. Sorry. Um, who is the author of, okay, Elizabeth, I will find out who the author is and get back to you. Um, okay, a little bit discussion about the book. Um, okay, Naomi, I think you kind of worded it right, the way I think about the book. It's like, I didn't like the red tent because it trivializes heroic people and distorts so much. Yeah, that would be like kind of the way I viewed it. Um, and yes, Diane, she said, prophecy not mentioned because everyone keeps saying Rachel seemed like a prophet. She wasn't a prophet, but respond to a spiritual calling from God. She was definitely a holy, righteous woman, regardless of whether or not she was a prophet. Um, and Madeline says, it's so selfless, not for us to judge. Um, and that's so interesting, Andrea, what you added about your daughter and what you bought for her. <laughs> oh, wait, let's see. Okay. Oh, I'm just going through these comments really quickly before we continue. Um, Andrea said, when my daughter, um, Rachel, and I were in Israel together, we bought a necklace with the skyline of Jerusalem for her. So I think that is a really interesting connection. Um, we know it's never too late. Um, okay. 
Yeah, um, just by the way, back to the red tent, because there's more comments on that. The way Gail said what she did like about it, even if Dina's narrative was changed from a rape into one of romance. I think that's like, that's a big deal. I don't know if anyone would ever want their rape story to be turned into a tale of romance. Just think that that's something to keep in mind. Okay. Um, okay, I think we got through these comments. All right. Got through the comments. Now, just a little bit, a little tad into something about Rabbi Akiva and Rachel's daughter, who I believe her name was Shalamis. Um, it doesn't say that in the text, but I believe so. Okay, by Gail. Okay, so um, um, text number 16, this is in the Talmud. The daughter of Rabbi Akiva did the same with Ben Azai. She too sent her husband away from home to study Torah. And this is that which people say, an ooh, is that how you pronounce it? Follows an ooh. As does the mother, so does the daughter. And then in the next text, it's like a play on words because the name, the Rachel means a baby lamb, an ooh. <laughs> and so it's a play on the name of Rabbi Akiva's wife, which is Rachel, like, right? So it's like, ooh is you, thank you. <laughs> you, a you. <laughs> Not a word that I think I've ever used before. But that's what the name Rachel means. So it's saying like, just like one lamb follows the other, so does like, like mother, like daughter. And Shalamis um, was very inspired by what her, her parents did. And she also sent away her husband to learn a lot of Torah. There's a whole nother story with that though. They did not stay married. Um, okay, so then here's another story about Shalamis. Text 18 from the Talmud. And I will just tell it to you. So Rabbi Kiva's daughter, Okay, I'll go through the story. So Rabbi Kiva's daughter once went to the market to buy things for the home, and she passed, who didn't stay married? Um, Shalamis with Ben Azai. He was, like, in very short, it's kind of interesting, because I said before, if you remember, like, in the class with Zipporah, that Zipporah and Moshe separated because Moshe, by command of God, because Moshe had to be, like, ready for, you know, being talking to God at any moment and like not really being able to be married and having family obligations and all of that or husband obligations. So, and I said like, we don't really see that anywhere else. In other words, Torah and Judaism values marriage so highly and intimate connection and husband, you know, even the Kohen Gadol, the high official that would work in the Holy temple had to be married. Like you, we really don't see that anywhere. Here's another case where, Ben Azai was like, um, in Hebrew, the word is like mufsha, which is like separate. Like he was too not of this world. He was too engrossed in his holiness that he couldn't either handle being married. So he didn't stay married. Um, okay, so Rabbi Akiva's daughter once went to the market to buy things for the home. And she passed a group of stargazers and fortune tellers. And one of them said to her, see that lovely girl, what a dreadful calamity is awaiting her. She's going to die on the very day of her wedding. Mark my word. So Rabbi Akiva's daughter overheard these words of the stargazer, but didn't pay any attention to it. And she had often heard it from her great father that he who observes the mitzvahs of the Holy Torah need fear no evil. So she was like, okay, great. These stargazers are saying this thing. I am, um, you would never say such a thing. What would you not say, Diane? telling a girl that she's going to die. I hope not. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know which thing you're referring to. Okay. Um, so as the, okay, you'll clarify for us, Diane. Okay. So as the happy day of her wedding approached, she had forgotten all about that stargazer. And on the day before her wedding, there was a lot to do. And at night she went to bed, tired and happy. And before going to bed, she took off her, like a, a golden hairpiece and she stuck it into the wall, which is, I guess, where she always just sticks into the wall, where she gets it out the next morning. Um, and the following morning, she pulls the pin out from the wall. And as she pulled it out, attached to the pin was a poisonous snake. And she realized that she could have been killed by that poisonous snake that was, like, lurking in the wall's crevices when, where she stuck in the pin the night before. And she realized it was a miracle that her life was saved. And, that, and then she remembered about the stargazer that had told her this, this thing, and she shuddered, and she heard a knock on the door, and it was her father checking in on her. 
Like, I heard you screaming, are you okay? And he sees the dead snake dangling from the pin. And she told her father everything that happened. And Rabbi Akiva said, yes, this is definitely a miracle. He says, tell me, what did you do yesterday, right? Like, what special mitzvah did you do that was probably the thing that saved your life? And at first she's like, I, you know, I don't know, nothing different, nothing special, but okay, this one thing, like last night, everyone was like so busy preparing for the wedding. A poor man came in, nobody really noticed him because he was like, everyone was just so busy. And I saw that he was hungry. So I took my portion of the wedding feast and gave it to him. And Rabbi Kiva had always known that his daughter was very devoted to the poor, but this was something very special. And he was very happy. And he said, tzedakah delivers from death. Tzedakah tatzil mi mabed. Tzedakah delivers from death is a very famous um, quote. So I think that this just gives us like a little glimpse into also Shalomis, who Rabbi Akiva and Rachel's daughter and, and what kind of person that she was. Clearly also a very special person. Um, okay, and this just to end off again with a few more beautiful quotes that Rabbi Akiva said about his wife. So yes, we definitely see this beautiful connection that, you know, Rabbi Akiva... In, in a sense, I would look at it that he gave up 24 years of his life. I mean, gave up, like to go learn by Elizabeth, um, that he, to go learn because his wife wanted it. And she happily encouraged and wanted her husband to do this. And there was this beautiful connection between the two of them. So in text number 19, in the Talmud, Rabbi Akiva stated, who is a rich man? One who has a wife full of beautiful deeds. Right. So clearly in text 20, he wasn't, he wasn't talking, he was talking about his spiritual fortune, not material wealth. Like he's, he's like, I'm rich because look at the wife that I have. Look at the quality of her character. Look at who she is. And text 21, alternatively, beautiful deeds refers to acts of tzedakah as well. Charity. Women encourage their husbands to distribute their wealth to poor people, which enables God's blessings to infuse their businesses and bring them riches. And we can see clearly also that those were, that was two very strong character traits of Rachel and as well as their daughter, right? That she um, embodied tzedakah and giving and charity. And so this gives us a glimpse into what we know about Rachel and the power of her character and of her personality and of her self-sacrifice, but it wasn't one of martyrdom. It wasn't one of victimhood right? Even, even martyrdom, like she did it lovingly. And will, it was her love of Torah, her love of her husband, her love of God, that really um, paved the way for her to, to do these things. We call it self-sacrifice, but I don't even know if she would call it that, which is so powerful to think about. Um, you're welcome, Maddie. Maddie said she absolutely loved this week. I agree. So many lessons to learn. Does anyone have any questions? or anything that they want to share. How old was the daughter when she got married? Rachel or Shalamis? Shalamis. Actually don't know, actually don't know the age of either of them. I could look, I don't know if we know, but I can, I can look it up and see. I'm only asking because if she was 24, he came back for her wedding. True. <laughs> <laughs> Although we don't know, I don't know how old she was when he left. Like she, if, mm -hmm. like she could even be, been a little bit older than that. But she was, he was definitely at her wedding because we can see that from the story. So yeah. either she was, so then that's a good uh, inference over there. So either she was like older than 24. Yeah, I, yeah <laughs> I, it, it must have been. My mom mm -hmm. said, thank you so much for a great class. You're so welcome. So good to see everyone. Um, yeah. I, yeah, she must. You know, Adina, I was thinking about how how a mixed uh, like this is like a mixed salad. This lesson because I'm going back and forth. I'm agreeing with the people who are saying how could he leave her, and then I also had this other insight having to do with it was their relationship, it was their choice, it was their marriage. And how many times do we stand outside of a relationship and say, "Are you kidding? I would never have that happen in my life." And there's this grace that you have to grant to people and their choices. That's really, really tough. I mean, yeah. you really want to step in and judge. And so this is a good lesson for me. It's, it's a tough one. And mm -hmm. the, my other thought was the idea that, that uh, Rabbi Kiva was also sacrificing his life. He was sacrificing a warm, happy life with his children and warm meals and being surrounded by that love for 24 years. We, we had this assumption, oh, he's out partying and she's home slaving away. But also yeah. he was 
was sacrificing something. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That's very true. Yeah. I think it, it is easy to just be like, oh, how could someone do that? Or right. But like, it doesn't have to work for us. Trust me. None of us are sending away our spouses for 24 years. I haven't, there's no other story. Let's put it this way. There is zero other story of something like that. Right. So this is clearly not like, well, Torah recommends that women send their husbands away for 24 years. Now we do have other, like, I still think that this is like a huge sacrifice where we have like women in, you know, like back in Russia that would like send their husbands for the high holidays to go be like their chassidim, right? Like they would have their husband go be by the Rebbe for the holidays. Cause that's where there was all this inspiration and for bringing. And I'm like, what? Like the, like the whole, all the holidays, like the wife is herself with the kids or whatever it is. Right. But like, so on smaller levels, we could see like the concept of like, yes, go be a part of this or whatever it is because of what you want for your husband or the, fa or the family or the inspiration or the vibe or whatever it is. But the Ruffle's story is so unique. So clearly it's not like, well, this is what everyone should be doing. And so I find it, it like, it doesn't have to be right for me, for me to respect it and be awed by it and be just amazed by Ruffle, honestly. And like, listen, the message that we should all take away from this is not like, how could I send my husband away for 24 years? But more like, do I encourage my spouse, significant other, people in my life, myself, to learn Torah? Do I see the value? Do I have the love of Torah that Rachel had to really bring that into the lives of the people around me, right? I think like that's the question we want to ask ourselves to learn from this. I think we have to point out that it was the condition for the marriage that you should learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Rachel from the beginning was like, right? What was her first thing? She's like, if you, if we go back to that first quote that we read, way back at the beginning, if I become betrothed to you, will you go to the academy to study Torah? Right? She like made it conditional. Like, will you do this? Because that is the condition that I'm going to marry you on, right? Um, whoops, Andrea got kicked out and is coming back. Yeah, so lots of beautiful things to keep in mind. And today is a day that we celebrate um, the mysticism of Torah, Torah learning, Torah knowledge, Jewish pride, Jewish unity, right? The teachings of Rabbi Akiva, Kamocha, loving every, you know, loving your neighbors, loving your fellow, right? So these are like the messages of today that are so powerful, combined with the humility that we read at the beginning, the hod of hod, the humility within humility. And I think we see an enormous amount of humility in both Rabbi Akiva and in Rachel. All right, before we end off to today, for today, does anyone have any other questions? Okay, so I'll just say one more time that we are continuing Torah and tea. So the next, I think, at least four Tuesdays at one o'clock, we'll have Torrent i I'll send out emails about, you know, handout and topic and all of that. And um, for your own enjoyment, more things that you can join. Again, Wednesday morning, 9.30, my husband does a Tanya class, Jewish mysticism, 12 o'clock, a Yiddish class, Thursday night, a ethics of our fathers, Pirkei Avot class, Friday, a Shabbat inspiration and L'chaim before Shabbat and Tuesday night, next Tuesday night, 7.30, we are doing a Q&A together. Rabbi Lanza and I are gonna to be together doing a question and answer. Any questions people have on um, inspired, <laughs> I don't know if inspired is the right word, but from the show, the Netflix show on Orthodox and we've been getting lots of questions and things from people. So we thought it would be really fun to do a Q&A, a live Q&A and anyone can um, ask questions and we'll just have a really open candid discussion on when is that the unorthodox? Sorry, say it again. When is that the unorthodox? Tuesday night at 7.30. Tuesday. So a week from today. Yeah. So we'll have Torah and Tia 1, and at 7.30 in the evening, we're going to do a, an open q and I have right. a question, Adina. Yes. Um, in, the, in the email that you sent out, there was a number for this Zoom. Yes. It's not correct because I used the old number, and that's why I was 10 minutes late. Ooh. I use the old number, 715, 
Um, so it, are all of your teachings going to be under that 715317 number? Okay, so I think I'm still figuring out Zoom myself. So what it is is like, I, I'm gonna do them always, they should always be able to, you can get to them always when you do jewishnovado.com forward slash Adina. That's when it's mine, right? Not when it's my husband's. But he said that some people like to just have the meeting ID. So I like copy and pasted my meeting ID, but maybe I just did the wrong one. Okay. No, it so, okay. I got on it with the new one. With the ID, meeting ID? I, I, got, I got a message that you were in the middle of another teaching and that as soon as you left that, you would come to this number that oh. you posted with the email and it wasn't so. Nothing mm. was happening. Huh. Okay. So go That's figure. Interesting. Okay, so I will like figure that out so that we don't have all these technical issues. And in the next email, I'll hopefully make it very clear, like this is the meeting ID always, and this is the link always. Thank you. So that you have that. My pleasure. All right, wishing you all a happy Lagba Omer. Thank you so much. Thank My you. pleasure. So wonderful Thank to see you, you all. Everyone, Thank you so much. Everybody. Thank you. See everybody. Jody, just really quickly, Thank Jody you. asked me, Jody Berman asked me if I'm going to watch it. So I'll tell you the truth. My husband watched it. I don't have that much interest in watching it, oh. but I have heard so much about it that I feel like I watched it. Like the, um, the scenes and how they played out. Like, I feel like I can tell you, but <laughs> yes, yeah, dirty. You have a question? Yeah. What do you feel about the condition that she, that Rachel put on Akiva that do you think she wanted to play a part in the life of a great person? Tell me what you mean by that. She willingly chose this, yeah. But no, but she also said to Rabbi Akiva that was if he wanted to marry her, then he had to go to basically do this. Yeah, because she saw his potential. She saw his greatness. Even though he knew not one word of anything. Okay. Isn't that amazing? But she was a daughter of a big judge. She was a daughter of a tzaddik also. I didn't understand you. She was also the daughter of a uh, Gadol. Her father right. was a well-known person. We spoke about Kalba Savua, right? And how he was a very learned and he was like a leader at that time. And he brought home all these eligible men in the sense yeah. that, right? Like he wanted her to marry a Torah scholar. So it's not like Rachel was like, no, I'm not interested in a Torah scholar. But she saw in Rabbi Akiva his potential, his greatness. And she was attracted to Rabbi Akiva and she said, I'll marry you, but you have to go learn. Right. And she, so she's yeah. really the one that like inspired him and got him to where he was. And he acknowledges her for that and says, everything I have, all my Torah learning, all your Torah learning is hers. Yeah. And how is it that he doesn't know what his son-in-law is up to? That Kalba Savua? Yeah. Because he disowned them. He had nothing to do with them. Well, he lived in a place where... I don't know, it seems weird. Yeah. He didn't know that that was his son-in-law. Yeah. Adina, I have a question. Yes. Uh, this is Anne. Hi, Anne. Um, hi, okay. Um, this is such a beautiful story and it's one aspect of the Rabbi Akiva story. Is there any more, given our circumstances now, now with the virus and the pandemic happening, is there any more you could tell us about the the plague that was happening that was going after Rabbi Akiva's students and the miracle of the fact that it stopped in a day? Yeah, I mean, the most I could say is it was actually like um, kind of a punishment. So the Rabbi Akiva, his biggest message, right, was love your fellow. And he produced these incredible students who are held to a much higher standard, like we, we spoke about before, that stu you know, Torah scholars and great people are held to different standards than the rest of us. And they didn't exemplify loving your fellow as yourself in the way that they should have um, or could have. And that's why this plague, they were like punished with a plague. Now, what does it mean that they didn't respect each other properly? It's like, you know, when you have... Um, you feel so right in something. And you're like, no, the other person needs to get it, right? Like they need to have my opinion. They need to see the way I see it because like this is the right way to see it. So it was sort of like there, it's kind of like when you 
love someone so much that you're like, you got to see it this way, <laughs> right? People can get very like um, caught up in their opinion and their view. And so that's what happened with the students is they were like, they would have these Torah discussions and Torah debates, but in a way of like, you got to see it this way, like this is the right way. And it wasn't the level of Ahava Yisrael, of love of your fellow that they were expected to um, adhere to or keep to. And so this was kind of like a punishment, this plague. So something must have happened to alleviate the punishment all of a sudden. Did, was there some turning point that um, made the punishment go away so miraculously? I don't know. Do you know, Ima, why it stopped? Because Rabbi Akiva did Daven, the way Moshe Daven and asked Hashem to save Miriam, the same way Rabbi Akiva put his cohort, everything he knew, to bring peace between his students. And but that, it, like 24,000 students too late. Like he had five more that remained alive, and one of them is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So we know about the five that didn't die in this plague, but like 24,000 of his students died. Yeah, but because it, they didn't see, as you say, the love of the fellow Jew over their ego. Their ego, their honor, was stronger than the love of the fellow Jew. Yeah. So that's what we know about it. Okay, thank you. Okay, my pleasure. Anyone else before we sign off? Thank you. No, okay. I will see you all next week, hopefully, or sometime else this week. And thank you all for joining.